for the love of the Holy Prophet Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful. The one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon His beloved Messenger, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajah. May God hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Wallahu shaheedum ala ma ta'maloon. And the Almighty God is a witness over your actions. Sadaqallahu al-Aliyu al-Azim. Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. When we examine the world today, we see that with all these technological advancements, there is less and less privacy. Everywhere you go in public, chances are there is a camera monitoring you, right? When you go to the mall, for example, you go to a big store like Target, Walmart, you see tens or hundreds of cameras monitoring you. In many intersections, there are cameras monitoring people. In New York City, in London, in Beijing. In fact, in London, in the city of London, there, are, there is a camera for, for every 14 people. There is a camera that is monitoring them. The minute you start walking in the streets of London, there is a camera that's monitoring you. There are over 420,000 cameras in London. In Beijing, there are over 480,000 cameras. So we see that one of the consequences of our modern technology is that we have less and less and less privacy, right? Many times our phone conversations, right? There's monitoring on them. Our activities, our activities on Facebook, on social media, it's all being monitored. In fact, once I read an article, either in the New York Times or the Washington Post, that the CIA has a facility close to Washington that has 5,000 employees. You know what their job is? They simply monitor the activity on Facebook. 5,000 trained individuals just monitoring what people say and do on Facebook. Because that's one source of intelligence, of gathering intelligence. So we see that with our modern technology, we have less and less privacy, and we're being monitored. There are even discussions that some governments are creating drones that can fly over our homes and they could see what we're doing inside our homes. Inshallah, we won't see that day. But it's happening. This is becoming a part of our lives. And how many people have been exposed by hidden cameras? You know, every once in a while, you get a clip on WhatsApp, you see it in the news, there is a hidden camera that's exposing someone. Two, three days ago, I saw a very disturbing one. In Saudi Arabia, there was this ruthless guy who had established an orphanage. There was a hidden camera in the orphanage. It shows that someone opened the door of the fridge, one of the kids, one of the orphans, 
And this crazy guy became furious. The guy who runs the orphanage. You know, why did they open the fridge without his permission? So he lines them up, those poor little kids, boys and girls. He has a stick in his hand and he starts beating them ruthlessly. My heart started aching when I saw that scene. This guy is crazy. Why open an orphanage when you are going to beat those kids? So we see that there are hidden cameras that sometimes even expose certain people. Well, this is in our physical dimension of our life with our technology. Brothers and sisters, what about the spiritual dimension? If in the physical dimension, there are so many cameras monitoring us. What about the delicate, amazing, detailed system of God? What kind of monitoring is there in the spiritual world? Let's see what the Holy Quran says. The Holy Quran tells us that we human beings are being monitored by over 10, 15 different ways. There are many witnesses who will come on the day of judgment and witness either for us or against us. Let's briefly go through these witnesses so that we pay more attention to our actions. The first witness is who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls himself shaheed. What does the word shaheed mean by the way? We usually know this word to mean a martyr, right? Someone who dies in the way of God. But that's not the literal meaning of shaheed. Shaheed in Arabic comes from shahada, to witness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a shaheed because God is a witness. He witnesses all of our actions. And too often we forget that. Now the reason why the shaheed who dies in the battlefield in the way of God is called a shaheed is because a martyr will witness on the day of judgment what happened to him, how he was unjustly killed. That's why we call them a shaheed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate shaheed, the witness. Too often we forget that. When we're in the privacy of our homes, when we're amongst our friends, when we're doing something, we forget that the Almighty God is actually witnessing. You know, we have this very cute story of a father who once took his little son, six-year-old son, to a farm. The father wasn't such a good man. He took his son to a farm and he wanted to steal fruits from the farm. So he told his son, my dear son, you stand at the gate of this farm. I'll go inside. I'll start picking the fruits. If you see anyone coming, approaching from far, anyone who wants to pass by, quickly notify me, alert me, so we can hide. If there's anyone who's watching us, quickly I need to know, we don't want to get in trouble, we don't want to get caught red-handed. He says, okay, dad. The father goes, right before he starts picking those fruits, his son gives him the red alert. He starts panicking, oh, there's somebody here. So he grabs his son and they hide. But he's watching, nobody passes by. He tells him, son, what's going on? Was that a false alarm? I don't see anybody here. He said, dad, didn't you tell me if someone is watching, I should notify you? Well, I remembered that God is watching us. And so I thought I'd remind you. He had a good mother who had raised him. God is always monitoring our actions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the first witness. And can we stand in the face of God's witness if we've done something and God is witnessing, can we deny it? Absolutely not. So that's the first witness. Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is the second witness who's monitoring our actions? The second witness is the messenger of God, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran that the Rasul, the messenger of God, is also a witness over you people. 
The Messenger of God witnesses our actions. Yes, everything that we do, everything that we say, the Messenger of God witnesses over our actions. Now, some people might find this a little bit strange, right? There are billions of people. How can the Messenger of God witness the acts of billions of people? That's not possible. Well, first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly mentions that in the Quran and we trust the word of God. That's number one. Number two, number two, let me ask you this question. Do you all believe the devil exists? Satan, does he exist? Well, the Quran talks about it. Every Muslim believes that the devil exists. Shaytan, right? Well, what is the role of the shaytan? To whisper, to tempt you, to stop you from goodness, to push you towards evil, right? So let me ask you this question. The devil, Satan, Iblis, does he see our actions or no? Not only does he see our actions, he can even see our thoughts. Otherwise, how is he going to whisper to you? Because the hadith says when a person makes the intention to do something good, to help someone, to donate, to pray, to visit parents, to do any good act, the devil comes and he whispers evil thoughts to us to distract us from that good and to stop. So not only can the devil see our actions, the devil can see our thoughts, can read our minds, right? Otherwise, how does he know that you're going to do something good and you've made the intention to do good? Well, let me now ask you this question. If the devil, the Satan, who's the enemy of God, who's evil, has been given such a power to witness and see what seven billion people are doing, you don't think God is going to give that power to his own friend and messenger? He's not going to give him that power. That's too much for us to accept. And if you think the Prophet's dead, no, he's, he physically died. The Holy Quran clearly states that the one who dies in the way of God is alive. They're alive with God, receiving their sustenance from God. Their soul witnesses our actions. So the Messenger of God sees our actions, especially the Muslim Ummah. Everything we do, the Prophet sees our actions. Sometimes we disappoint the Prophet with our actions and sometimes we make him happy. In one hadith, the sixth Imam of Ahl al-Bayt, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, he was talking to his companions, he told them, مَا لَكُمْ تُؤْذُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Why do you keep hurting the Messenger of God? They were surprised. What is he talking about? The Prophet died a hundred years ago. How are we hurting the Prophet? He told them the Prophet sees your actions. When you sin, when you do immoral acts, when you cause problems, the Prophet sees that and that hurts the Prophet. It disappoints the Prophet. Why do you keep hurting the Messenger of God? So the Messenger of God witnesses our actions, monitors our actions. That's the second witness that the Holy Quran talks about. There's many, I'll just share five today. So that's the second. Who is the third witness? The two angels, right? The angels of God. In a number of verses, the Holy Quran says that the angels of God are witnesses. They monitor our actions. They record every move we make. Every word I utter is recorded. Every act I make, every act I commit, it's being recorded by these angels. In Surah Qaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about two angels who witness over every word and they write it. مَا يَلْفِظُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ he does not speak a word except that these two angels, Raqib and Atid, they record that. They're witnessing over that. So all the angels of God, they have a task 
Some of them, their task is just to record our actions. Every single human being, everything that we do, there's a concise system by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is recording our moves. So that's the third witness, the third group who's monitoring us. Who's the fourth one? Our conscious, well yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us our conscious to tell us what's right, what's wrong, to guide us to that. But something in our environment, it's mentioned in the chapter of the earthquake, Surah Al-Zilzila. Allah makes a reference to it. The earth, yes. One of the witnesses on the day of judgment, brothers and sisters, is the very earth that we walk upon. The very ground. It will speak to the Almighty God. The Quran says that. يَوْمَئِذٍ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا The earth on the day of judgment will speak news. It will speak. Oh Allah, this person did this act on me while walking on me. The very ground, brothers and sisters, the very ground that is carrying us is a witness. It's going to witness everything we did, wherever we went, everything we did. And by the way, that's why it's recommended in Islam not to pray in one single place. Pray in different places. In your house, if you have a room that you pray in, Pray in this corner, in that corner, in this room, in upstairs, downstairs, in the basement. Why? Because the hadith says on the day of judgment, all those parts of the ground will witness that you prayed on them. And you'll have more witnesses who are going to witness that you worshipped God. So it's recommended to actually pray in a number of places. You go to your friend's house, it's time for salah. Don't say, let me wait back. Let me wait till I go back to my house. No, pray there. That's another place that will witness for you. So the very ground that carries us, brothers and sisters, will witness. That's the fourth one. Who is the fifth one? The closest one to you. The Holy Quran in a number of verses talks about our hands, feet, ears, our skin, our skin on the day of judgment will witness and will speak. The Quran talks about the scene on the day of judgment where we're standing before God, before the creation of God. And then God asks us about some deeds, but we stop. We're ashamed of those deeds. So we stop. We stop talking, we stay quiet. Then what happens? Suddenly you see your skin, as the Quran says, your body parts, they start speaking. And they will say to their skins, why did you witness against us? قَالُوا أَنْطَقَنَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي أَنْطَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ What will they say? The Quran says they will say, God commanded us to speak. God, the one who gives speech to anything that he wants. God commanded us to speak. Even our own skin, our own body parts, will witness on the Day of Judgment. Everything is being recorded. Now I know what some of you are thinking. I myself had, have the same thought. So are we doomed? All these spiritual cameras monitoring every move, that's it? We're exposed, there's no hope? What am I gonna do on the Day of Judgment? No, because we have a merciful Lord. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all these things monitoring our actions, but the, mighty, the Almighty God is such a generous, loving, compassionate Lord who cares about our dignity. And the Almighty God has given us the opportunity
to wash everything that we've done, to erase all of that. And that is through what? Repentance. When we repent to God, when we seek God's forgiveness, do you know what the Imam السلام, says? And Imam Sadiq السلام, says, Man taba taba Allahu alayhi. The one who seeks God's repentance, does tawbah, God is so generous, He forgives. He accepts our repentance. But it doesn't stop there. It does not stop there. When you ask God to forgive you and God forgives you, you know what happens after that? The Imam says, first of all, those angels who are recording your deeds, not only will God erase those bad deeds, but God will make these two angels forget what you even did. Because God is so sensitive about our dignity that when you have repented from a sin, God does not want the angels to even know that you did that sin. That's how generous He is. So the angels, once you've repented, they won't even know you even did that sin. Because God wants them to view you favorably, right? Because if these angels are seeing our history, our dark past, all those ugly sins, you know, they're not going to view us so favorably, right? Even after we repent. So God makes them forget that I even committed that sin. And that's truly from the Rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And instead of those sins, right? It's not like God will just erase those sins. God will replace those sins. Replace them with what? أُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدُّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ Those very bad deeds that I committed, God, it's not that He'll just erase them, no. God will transform them into good deeds. God will write good deeds. Now you may be wondering, because some philosophers have objected, wait a minute. A sin is inherently bad, it's evil. How can an evil sin, a bad sin, transform into a good deed? Well, let me give you the example of a tree. When you have a tree, for this tree to produce the best fruits, right? In a natural environment, what's the best thing to give the tree? Besides, of course, watering it. Fertilizer, right? Natural fertilizer is even better than the chemical fertilizers we have. What is natural fertilizer? Is it something pure? No, it's not. You feed the tree fertilizer. It takes that fertilizer. It converts it to a sweet, delicious fruit. You see what a tree does? Take something contaminated, something like fertilizer, and it produces the most beautiful fruits for you. Well, tawbah, repentance, is like a tree. It takes your sins, it converts them into good deeds when you repent. Show me more mercy than that. Show me more compassion from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than that. That He's actually taking your bad deeds. On the day of judgment, you meet God, you see all these good deeds you never made. You're like, oh God, What's this? I never committed those good deeds. Allah says, yes, you didn't, but you repented. So all those bad deeds, I converted them into good deeds for you. That's the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Imam alayhi salam, he says, God will, will make the angels forget what you did. That's number one. Number two, God will instruct the earth not to expose you. Allah will instruct your body parts do not expose this person on the Day of Judgment. That's the Rahmah of Allah. So although we have all these monitors monitoring our actions and witnessing on the Day of Judgment over our actions, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. He has always opened the door of mercy, of compassion, of repentance for us that, so that we truly repent to Him. And then the Imam says, if this person really repents, this person will die 
without anything witnessing against him, will die pure. And all these things that we mentioned, they will witness for him on the day of judgment. That this person repented, this person worshipped the Almighty God. So let's be thankful to this merciful Lord who is so merciful with us to the point where he's going to convert our sins into good deeds. He's not going to expose us because Allah is merciful and he protects our dignity. And we should be thankful to having such a merciful and wonderful Lord. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all, my brothers and sisters. Let's now open the floor for any questions and answers that you might have or answers that we might present today or any discussions that you would like to have. Uh, the brother here has a question. Uh, in chapter 22, Al-Hajj, the fifth verse talks about mentioned people. And it's <coughs> there, and I quote, and some we cause to die young. End of quote. Why? Why does God cause some to die young? That's a very good question. We know that death knows no age. Some people die very young, others in their middle ages, others in their old ages. Why would God, who's loving and merciful, have someone, allow for someone to die at a young age? There are a number of reasons why someone might die at a young age. First of all, one common factor is our own deeds. Sometimes through our own mistakes, through our own deeds, God shortens our lives. We have many narrations about that. For example, cutting ties with your relatives, with your family, is something that cuts one's life short. This is a consequence of our actions. Just like in the physical world, if you don't eat healthy, right? If you do drugs, you're smoking, you don't watch what you eat, you could die young by having a heart attack, right? Not eating healthy shortens your life. Well, same in the spiritual world. There are some deeds, some bad deeds, like cutting ties with one's family, causing trouble with one's family, not being good to one's parents. These cut our lives short. This is just a natural consequences of our actions. To the contrary, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prolongs your life if you pay charity and establish good ties with your family. The hadith says some people, God had willed for them to live 30 years. But because they paid charity, because they established good ties with their family, God extends it to another 30, so they end up living 60. So one reason is our deeds. Some of the deeds that we commit actually shorten our lives. But this doesn't apply to everyone. This may apply to some people. Second reason, a test. God wants to test the parents. Because there's nothing more difficult than losing your son or daughter. Right? Well, that's how God tests us. Because remember, why did we come to this world in the first place? To live, work, and have families? Yes, we're supposed to do that, but that's not why we're here. Why are we here in the first place? To be tested. It's a trial. God is trying us. And part of this test is going through difficulty. That faith that a person shows, when do you show it? In times of difficulty, when you lose a loved one, when you lose a son or daughter in their young age, that's when you have the opportunity to show God how much faith you have by not objecting to His will. And the hadith says the one who loses a child and they accept God's will, God makes it mandatory for this person to go to paradise. Because God knows the pain and suffering that this person is going through. So the second reason is to be tested. Number three, Sometimes God allows a person to die at a young age because God knows through His infinite knowledge that if this person lives to be older, either something tragic would happen to this person 
or this person would commit a major sin or something bad will happen to this person's life, God wants to protect this person from going through that. So God will end this life and take this person to the hereafter and bless him in the hereafter. So it's actually a way to save this person because God knows what lies ahead of us in our lives, right? Sometimes God knows, you know, if this 20, 30 year old person, if he lives into being 40, 50, this person will experience so many tragedies that this person might not handle them. This person might collapse. So out of his mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves them that, all that trouble. You know, we've seen many people, brothers and sisters, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, they might go through very deep suffering, maybe chronic depression. Some people end up committing suicide, right? So if God knows that this person, just as a small example, there's many tragedies we can think of. Let's say God knows this 30 year old person, if he lives 10, 20 more years, he will fall into severe depression, he's gonna end up committing suicide. Well, God doesn't want that for him and his family. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might take him earlier to save him from that. So there are a number of reasons why God will, you know, take a person earlier and one final reason is some people pass their test in this life and once God sees that they've passed their test, there's no reason why they should stay any longer because they were here for that test. And to give you an example, imagine if you go to school or college, you're in the examination hall and the professor distributes to you the test, right? The professor says, I give you two hours to do this test. But let's say you have a bright student who finished the test in 30 minutes. What, what, what should they do? Should they sit an hour and a half, do nothing? No, they could submit their test and leave. Same with some young people in this life. They fulfill their test. God says, well, there's no reason why you should stay here. Let me take you to paradise. Let me take you to my permanent life in the year after. So that could be another reason. Does, does that answer the question? You're welcome, brother. Any other questions, comments, discussions? Someone wanted to ask this question. How can God forgive someone who talks about others? How can God forgive someone who talks about others, you know, like backbiting or accusing others? When we talk about repentance, we have to know that repentance comes in stages. Some people think that if I just sit there, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, that's it. I'm done. That's not how it works. It comes in stages. The first stage of repentance is the heart. It starts in the heart. You have to really feel regretful. The Imam السلام, says, the first step to repentance is remorse, regret. Because some people claim to repent, but honestly, they don't feel that regret. And when you, and when you don't feel that regret, it shows that you're not that sincere. Remorse and regret reveals sincerity, that you're serious about your repentance and you truly feel bad about it. Some people, they don't feel bad about the sins they've committed. Well, it's difficult to repent when you don't feel bad about your sins. So the first step is to genuinely feel bad about it. That indicates that you're serious and you're honest. So that's step number one, to truly feel bad about it if you've injured someone you've affected somebody's reputation, feel bad about it. Have that regret and remorse. Yes, that feeling of guilt must be there. So that's number one. Number two, you ask God then to forgive you. You pray to the Almighty God to forgive you. You humble yourself so that you ask the Almighty God to remove arrogance from your heart and you admit that you did something wrong because some people it's hard for them to admit. You, once you admit that humbly, that's the second step. The third step, if you can, you have to fix the wrong you caused. So if you talk negatively about someone, you gave them a bad reputation, now if you want to truly repent, you have to fix that. Restore the reputation of that person. In that gathering which you wronged this person, which you attacked this person, which you 
you know, gossiped about this person's faults or whatever it was, you exposed this person, you have to go and save that person's reputation. If it was an accusation that you made, something that was false, you have to go and correct it and say, look, I was wrong, I was misinformed, whatever it was, this person is not like that. Restore that person's reputation. This is an obligation that we have. So do something to restore the reputation of this person. If you're in a gathering like the one you were in, when you attack that person, praise that person. Speak highly of them so that people start viewing them positively. And finally, if you have access to that person and you can, it's not going to cause further trouble, ask their forgiveness. I know it's very difficult, but that's how we get rid of our arrogance. Go to that person with humbleness, with humility. Tell them that what you said was uncalled for, it was wrong, and that you asked their apology. Go and apologize to them. So once you do that, then yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that He's going to forgive. But let's say that person passed away, you don't have access to that person, it's difficult for you to go to them. Do good deeds on their behalf. Take out charity and pay it and say, oh Allah, I wronged so-and-so person. He's, I don't have access to this person anymore. So I give this charity on behalf of that person to compensate for what I did. That's one great way to ask God for forgiveness. So we have to go through these stages for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, to forgive us. Any other questions? Doesn't have to be related to our topic, if there's anything else on your mind, anything else you're interested in. Yes, brother, I'll get to you. Yes, brother. You mean you received gifts from someone? Yes. You okay. So the brother is asking about khums, the 20% charity that we have to pay on the net profit that we did not use. Let's say January 1st comes, it's your day of paying your khums. And let's say you didn't make any income for that year or whatever income you made, you spent it already. Let's say you have gifts. Someone gave you gifts. Are you liable to pay khums on the gifts or not? The ruling is, if you used those gifts, let's say it was a dress and you wore it, you used it, even if it was once, but the point is you used it before January 1st, or let's say someone gives you, gave you cash and you use that cash. You bought something with it, you gave it to someone. If you use the gift, you don't have to pay any khums on it. Because that is considered part of your expenditures. Part of your expenses, so you don't have to pay any khums on it. However, if you did not use it, you got a lovely dress, a lovely gift, but that date came when you have to pay your khums, and you did not use the gift. You did not you know, wear that dress even once. You did not use that gift. Or let's say someone gave you cash and you did not use the cash. It's sitting on the side. In that case, do you have to pay khums on it or not? Yes, in that case, because you did not use the gift, technically it was not part of your expenses for that year before January 1st. So you would have to pay what's equivalent to 20% of its value. Yes, you would have to pay khums on it if you did not use it. Okay, another part. Let's say, same thing, like January 1st come, and you did the khums for 10,000, which is the 20%. And then, but you have an extra money, more than the 10. But in your attention, you, buy, you wanna buy a house for your 10. But you take in your <coughs> Okay, so let's say if you have, the brother's asking if you have some money 
and you plan on buying something in the future with this money, such as a house, for instance. So technically, you did not spend it this year, but you're saving it for, let's say, next year to buy something. In that case, would you have to pay khums on it? Scholars state, because technically, you did not spend it that year, you still owe khums on it, yes. Otherwise, if that's the case, you know, nobody will pay charity, right? Nobody will pay khums because we're always some, saving something for the future, right? To buy something in the future. So, if you did not spend it that year, yes, you would owe khums on it. You're welcome, brother. Uh, yes, brother, and I'll get to you. Why is Friday the holy day in Islam? That's a good question. We know that, you know, different religions have their holy days. Friday in the religion of Islam was a day assigned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we thank the Almighty God, we worship the Almighty God, we gather with families. It's highly recommended to visit one another on Friday. We have the Friday prayer, which is an act of worship. It's highly recommended, you know, to wear new clothes, clean clothes on Friday. So Friday is definitely a day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed in Islamic law, in the Islamic religion. Thursday, it starts, by the way, not on Friday. When does it technically start? Thursday night at sunset. Islamically, Friday starts Thursday night at sunset. So when sunset happens on Thursday, in this, Islamically you're in Friday. Friday has already started. Because the Islamic days end at sunset and the new day begins at night always, at sunset. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. That's why on, Friday, on Thursday nights we have Dua Kumain, right? So when you're reciting Dua Kumain on Thursday nights, you're actually reciting it in Friday Islamically. So Friday is a day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to have once a week to worship Him. The Almighty God blessed that day and He informed us that this is a day of blessing. In fact, we have narrations that tell us every Friday is a Eid. And by the way, what does the word Eid mean? Holidays? What does it mean? From Ziyara visit, you're getting close. To repeat, you're getting closer. To return, right? When someone returns back from their travelings, what would you say in Arabic? Adam and Safar, right? The word Eid in Arabic linguistically is derived from the word Aud, which means to go back. Well. What does going back have to do with all these Eids and celebrations? Going back to who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After 30 days of worshipping God in the month of Ramadan, we go back pure to our Lord. And that's really why we're celebrating. We're celebrating because we have completed acts of worship. So, Every Friday is a Eid, it's a day in which we go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worship God, we visit our families and friends, and that is something to celebrate for. When you are worshipping the Almighty God, then we have to be thankful to the Almighty God about that and celebrate. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has assigned Friday for the Muslim Ummah to be a day of Eid and a day of worship. Everything is multiplied on Friday. Every good deed that you commit, you make, it's multiplied. Every act of charity that you give, it's multiplied. So it's really a wonderful and blessed day that we should observe. Uh, yes, brother, you had a question. I'm done, thank you, I heard a lot. <laughs> May Allah bless you. We'll take one last question or comment or observation if you have any. Yes, brother. Tested uh, uh, so that we can 
be, it can be determined uh, what our position is going to be in the hereafter. Okay, now, having said that, we all know that uh, when, uh, when Allah said to the angels, bow down, and they bowed down. Now, we also know that Iblis was there. And it seems that this was all uh, just happenstance. But I think that it was all pre-planned. Is that correct? Because if, if suppose Iblis was not there, there would be no devil, there would be no temptation, there would be no test. What if he was there and bowed down with the angels? And so it's not random, is it? It's pre-planned. Allah knew that he would be there. Allah knew what he was going to say. So that's why we have a devil. Correct? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in this life to test us. That's the main purpose. Yes, he wants to have mercy on us, but to achieve that mercy is by taking this test and hopefully completing the test. So that was the whole reason why God created us, we human beings. Now, when we go back to the story of God instructing the angels to bow to Adam alayhi salam, Satan was not amongst the angels. He was made from the jinn. He's a jinni. He was created from fire. He used to mingle with the angels. He used to worship God with the angels, but he didn't really do it sincerely. He just wanted to show off and to declare himself to be better than the angels. So God created Adam salam, and he wanted to bring him to this earth so he would test him and his progeny, which are the human beings. Now the Almighty God knew that the devil out of his arrogance will refuse to bow to Adam and God would enable him to whisper to us to test us. God knew all of that. It was planned by the Almighty God. But it does not mean that if the devil was not present there or let's say he would have bowed, Theoretically, he would have bowed to Adam. It does not mean that the test would have stopped. No. God would have found another way to test us because that was the point. God just decided through his wisdom that this is the best way to test us. And remember, before the devil, before the devil, we have what? Influencing us. Our desires, right? Our evil inciting soul, as the Quran says. We have two dimensions in our souls. We have the dimension that pushes us to goodness, and that is the intellect. And then we have what? The evil inciting soul driven by our desires. So oftentimes when we commit certain deeds, certain sins, it's not just that the devil is whispering to us. No, we have that inside of us. It's built in. The tendency to do wrong, it's built inside of us to test us. So God would have figured out another way to test us. So yes, in one sense it was planned by God in the sense that he knew this would happen. But he gave the devil free will. He was not forced to do this. In fact, God reprimanded him. He told him, I am the one who created Adam and I as your Lord am commanding you to prostrate. But his arrogance did not allow him to do that. So he was not forced. God knew through his knowledge that through his own free will, the devil would not bow to Adam. So we could say in a sense that God did have this plan, definitely. And if the devil decided to worship, uh, to bow to Adam, God would have found a different way to test us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all brothers and sisters. It was very good to address you this morning. I will pray that Allah protects you all and you keep me in your prayers. Wassalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته. الله يبارك فيكم حبيبي. الله يكسب